Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. I'm Trevor Burris. And our guest today is Sheldon Richmond. He's the keeper of the blog Free Association at SheldonRichmond.com, senior fellow at the Center for a Stateless Society, and contributing editor at Antiwar.com. He's also the author of three books, Separating School and State, Your Money or Your Life, and Tethered Citizens, and the forthcoming volume, The Constitution Revisited. So today we're going to be talking about a couple of posts that you had up at your free association blog on – one's called The Constitution Revisited. The other is called The Bill of Rights Revisited. Um, and so maybe let's – I'll start by just reading the, the opening of The Constitution Revisited post and you can then expand on it a bit for us. So you say, I am mystified that so many libertarians still see the US Constitution as a landmark achievement in the struggle for liberty. On principle alone, they should have become wary in time. A document that is adored at virtually every, every position in the political firmament should arouse suspicion among libertarians. Uh, well, thank you. Nice to be here. Uh, yes, um, I've been in the libertarian movement for uh, quite a long time. I, I won't uh, utter the number. It's a big number. Uh, and um, I, I am surprised that there is this uh, reverence and adoration for not just the Constitution itself, but the Philadelphia Convention of 1787 and the uh, what we call the Founding Fathers. They're treated sort of as demigods, uh, uh, fairly uniformly. Uh, uniformly, there there is some exception made for Alexander Hamilton, which maybe we can uh, mention uh, later on. But but uh, there's this idea that this was a libertarian moment, that it was a, a major landmark in the long struggle for liberty. And um, I'll, I'll confess that I shared that uh, earlier on, but as time went by, and I won't say that I was suddenly struck by lightning or had some you know, polling conversion on the road to, uh, well, I guess I shouldn't say Damascus these days, should I? Uh, that um, I didn't have this moment where uh, I realized uh, what was wrong with that view. It takes time, but I'm, I'm just surprised that uh, after all these years, I still see a huge amount of libertarian uh, sentimentalism about the Constitution, or what, or what Jeffrey H Rogers Hummel calls uh, constitutional fetishism. Should we at least uh, be appreciative, or maybe amazed at the fact that to create the United States government, or at least the second version of the United States government, we did have a bunch of pretty smart people get into a room for four months and debate, at least sometimes, basic questions about the role of government, the proper use of government, the interests involved in government in a way that had not really been done before. So at least should we, we be appreciative that our country began or the second government began with a philosophical debate, which I mean libertarians are pretty into philosophy and most countries have not begun with a philosophical debate. Well, you know, England underwent a uh, pretty explicit uh, debate, maybe not at one place, in you know one uh, hall, in one city, in one year or less than one year. But you know there was some pretty pretty explicit discussion about the the, the limitations on the the monarchy and government in general. Uh, I don't know that uh, the U.S. is unique. Um, I don't think it was a really fair debate. I mean that's part of what I'm trying to point out here. Uh, and I'm drawing on historians who uh, are eminent in their field. I'm thinking particularly of all the articles that you mentioned, uh, explicitly quote Gordon Wood, who is a, an eminent historian <clears throat> uh, uh, of this uh, period, but also Merrill Jensen, who, who did a huge amount of work on the Articles of Confederation in the first uh, years of the United States under the Articles of Confederation and the move toward a, a constitutional convention. You could argue that it wasn't a fair debate. It, 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 it doesn't really live up to the folklore. And that's what one of the things I try to point out in these two pieces. Is the Constitution I – mean, I guess we can sort of get to the heart of it. You write uh, that the Constitution uh, – we should view the Constitution not as a landmark in the struggle for liberty but rather as a move to introduce elements of monarchy and aristocracy into an American political system that had become too democratic for America's upper crust. Now. On one level, it seems like you're kind of doing the Charles Beard economic interpretation of the Constitution-ish kind of thing uh, and saying it, it's not even a limited government document at all. Would you say it's it, – it, is that what you're saying? It's not a limited government document? Uh, 
no, I, I would not say it's not a limited government document. And I, and I don't want to embrace, certainly not fully, the, the Beard uh, uh, thesis. Uh, I think Beard's thesis is, is too, um, uh, eco- you know, uh, Determinate, too much determinative. Uh, it, economic determinism. Yeah. I mean, his story is, and it's somewhat picked up by Albert J. Nock, whose work I like on the Constitution, but he's a little too much of a Beardian in uh, Our Enemy of the State. He's the one who called the Philadelphia Convention a coup d'etat which I think is uh, not far off the mark. I think the problem with Beard is that he has these, uh, these men who assembled in Philadelphia in 1787 were, were all um, creditors. Right? They held government credit and wanted to make sure they uh, you know, would get the full, their full amount. Uh, that's not totally wrong, but I don't think that was the ma- if that was a motivating factor, it was not the only one, and it may well not have been the major one. I think there was a, a bigger view in the, in the minds of these, these guys, particularly Madison and Hamilton. They had a larger view, which is, you'll notice, I don't talk about that in the two pieces. I don't talk about the Beardian thesis at all. Uh, I think they went to Philadelphia because, for what you just said. Uh, the, the revolution was truly radical in this, and I'm using that in the sense that Gordon Wood uses it in his, his really good book, his excellent book, The Radicalism of the American Revolution. And what the radicalism for, for Wood is that um, it was an egalitarian, political and socially egalitarian revolution. And what was going on at the state level before the Constitution, during the period of the Articles, is that uh, common people were men, white men, let's, of course, we have to say, but still commoners, not gentlemen, as the term was used, plebeians, were getting in the government and using the government for, for their uh, particular economic interests. And people generally were interested in their particular economic interests. They weren't living up to the classical Republican model that both the Hamiltonians and the Jeffersonians uh, saw as, as the proper uh, you know, a uh, vision for the new country, and they turned to the Constitutional Convention to, as as you as you quoted me, to introduce elements of aristocracy, hierarchy, and even monarchy. And, and this even goes to Madison, as I spell out monarchy back into the American system, take power away from the states, and put it into the national government, and make sure the right kind of people would get be elected. In other words, they wanted the system to weed out the the plebeians and weed in the patricians because the patricians, the gentlemen, were seen as people who were above the fray. They didn't have to make a living. They weren't in the day to day, you know, hub, hub uh, you know, hubbub of the marketplace, and therefore they could mediate among the p- contending individual interests. That's what they saw. Now they wanted, they believed in personal liberty. I, and as I say in the second piece, when I talk about the Bill of Rights. I'm not saying they wanted a dictatorship of arbitrary government as long as they were in charge. I don't think they did. I mean, they, they learned lessons from uh, uh, the British monarchy uh, as the monarchy, not in the theory of the monarchy, but as the monarchy was uh, you know, uh, operating day to day. They didn't want arbitrary government, but they didn't see the government that they were setting up in, uh, uh, in Philadelphia as the protect, ultimate protector of liberty. The purpose of that machinery was to make sure the right people got in power and those people would be the protectors of individual uh, freedom. I, it might be uh, helpful as, as they, as they saw. It might be helpful here to give a bit of background or context to this because this is all in you know, they're establishing with the new constitution they're establishing a different set of rules for the structure of government and governing which is a reaction to the rules that were in place at the time, the Articles of Confederation. So could you give us a bit of info on the Articles of Confederation and specifically the kinds of rules that they had in place that were contributing to or enabling these issues that they – that the people drafting the new constitution saw and wanted to fix or address? Yes, that's very important because I don't see how you can judge the Constitution outside of its historical context. Uh, you know, I would go so far to say if the if the U.S. Constitution were the first Constitution, you might say, "Okay, nice try. They made a mistake, but nice try." But you need to look at what came before, and then it seems to me you don't say "nice try." A libertarian shouldn't say "nice try." What came before was the Articles of Confederation, which are found. You can easily find them online and, and read them. Uh, they were adopted during the, um, uh, I believe, the Second Constitutional, uh, Second um, Continental Congress, uh, 
in Philadelphia. <clears throat> and what they did was they set up what I would call a quasi central government, quasi national government. The reason I say quasi is because, and this is very important for libertarians, this government had no power to tax, to lay taxes of any kind or to regulate trade. Now, I call it a quasi government because it did ultimately get funded by tax revenues, but they had to go to the states with hat in hand. And of course, the the problem for the Madisonians and the Hamiltonians was that the, the states weren't uh, sometimes withheld the money or they say the checks in the mail or something the equivalent of it. And so there was uh, trouble raising money. And there were a couple of proposals during the years of the Article of Confederation, which was in effect eight years, not an insignificant amount of time, uh, where they tried to get a tariff, like a 5% tariff for the national government. So it would have some independent source of revenue. But this would get vetoed by us one state or another, Rhode Island, I think, New York. And under the rules, any amending of any amending of the Articles of Confederation had to be unanimously approved by the 13 states, now states. It was called the United States of America, by the way, by then. And um, th it had essentially only one branch of government, namely the Congress. The, the Congress elected the executive uh, and he was known as the president of the United States. So actually, George Washington was not the president. There were about, what, some like, like 10 previous presidents. Uh, I think John Hansen is usually regarded as the first because I think he served his full term was during the period of the Articles. I think the, the very first president, he straddled. He was president right before the Articles took effect and then right after, so he sometimes not counted. But anyway, be that as it may, uh, we had uh, several people who were known as presidents of the United States but they were members of Congress, sort of like a prime minister. Uh, so there was not a separate branch. Uh, now, the story we're all, we're all taught is that there were severe problems during these eight years. Uh, one of the great myths of this period is that um, states were erecting trade barriers against, each, uh, against one another, tariffs against one another. And this is a great myth, as Je Jeffrey Hummel uh, shows. Um, the, it's not the case that New Jersey would put up trade barriers against New York, et cetera. What the, 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 all that happened really was that on a, on a couple of occasions, a state would say, let's say New Jersey would say, to, uh, would say that a European goods that come through New York will have to pay a duty. In other words, it was aimed at European goods, not at, aimed at New York goods or other American goods. It, in other words, the United States was already a free trade uh, zone. Uh, which bashes one of the great myths about the Constitution, that the Constitution was needed to create a free trade zone. Now, here's another bit of proof for this. Alexander Hamilton argues in the Federalist Papers, and I forget what number, it may be 73, uh, that he says, if we would adopt this Constitution, we could treble the tariff. That's a pretty big admission. See, I think what, what he was saying was, as long as the states were more or less independent, there would be competition toward economic freedom toward free trade. They, people, uh, states would be lowering any tariffs that they had in competition. And he was calling for a cartelization of the states in order to get the, the uh, tariff three times as high. And uh, I think that's what we can look at the Constitution as a move toward cartelizing the states, uh, no. but not in the interest of, of uh, people in the states, rather, but rather this national, like I say, this national government that would hover above the, the great fray and uh, mediate all these contending interests. Now you mentioned because you mentioned Hamilton and and you do and you mentioned previously that he might be a little bit of an outlier but uh, when we're talking about interpreting what the constitution sort of became now I think there is no reasonable argument that the constitution was written to increase the powers of the national government. That's that's I think beyond dispute. Uh, yeah. the, the question is how much sort of a, a of a runaway or the intent behind some of these framers or the, the body of them as a whole wanted it to be uh, substantially larger than maybe people think or, or our current story because – so Hamilton's a bad example as you kind of alluded to previously. It's kind of uh, weird to put into the constitutional mix at all because 
in mid June of the convention, he he gave a, essentially a speech saying he wanted a monarchy that was very similar to England, and I, and no one seconded his speech. And then he left the convention for almost the entire convention and didn't come back until September. New York didn't actually even have a delegation there for most of the time, and he and he agreed to sign the Constitution, but it was clearly not what he wanted uh, out of the out of the mix. So, is using Hamilton's desires for troubling the tariff or something like this a, a really good Good use of, of 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 trying to figure out what the document means or what the intent behind it was. Well, of course, Hamilton is a major uh, contributor to the Federalist Papers. Uh, he and Madison, uh, Jay, only contributes a relative few. So he's he's a huge campaigner for the Constitution. I think that somewhat offsets your point about his having left. No, he did he want a stronger executive. Uh, than than say Madison did, although like uh, you know Madison is not totally innocent in this in this uh, regard, and I guess we'll get into that. Uh, sure, he's he's further out on the spectrum, uh, what, what, if you want to call it to the right, to the right side of the spectrum, uh, than than Madison is. Ma- Madison is is uh, Jefferson has Madison's ear to a large extent, so Je- so Madison is sort of in between, and he's trying to find some balance, I think, between. Jefferson and and, uh, and and Hamilton, but it's his plan. The, the Virginia plan is his blueprint, and that's what they worked from when they got to Philadelphia. I should mention when they got to they got to Philadelphia uh, on the on the to, their mandate was to amend the Articles of Confederation. As I said, that requires a unanimous consent of the states. When they got there, they locked the doors. The public was not allowed in, um, and they tore tore up the Articles of Confederation. Uh, they they hardly transferred anything from it, and then they changed the rules of ratification, where you only needed nine states, not uh, unanimous. So I, I should we should say that as far as the uh, uh, historical background goes, I think it's important to realize what they were doing there. That, I think that helps uh, Knox uh, Knox theory that uh, that this was a a coup d'état. Uh, yes, but but, but the the but, counter to that is is they they knew that they were doing this to some extent. They uh, they you look at the mandate from the Continental Congress, which was issued in the fall of 1786 after the previous collapse of no one showed up at the convention to amend the articles in, in the early fall of 1786. So it does say to, for the purpose of amending the articles. But uh, but the way they tried to cure the, the this defect of amending the articles was to create a ratification system that was going to be more populous because the articles weren't ratified by the people in the way that the, the constitution was. So does the ratification system cure the defect of what your – this sort of coup d'etat theory? Well, maybe in, in, in formally it, it might. Um, however, you know, looking back with public choice lenses, I think we can say that uh, it, it wouldn't do that entirely. Uh, Pauline Mayer in her book Ratification uh, says there was some uh, uh, hanky panky on the part of the Federalists. They tended to control the mail. They tended to, they were they were more orient you know, they were more concentrated in the in the cities, the urban areas. Uh, they controlled uh, newspapers, and they had some advantage advantages in stifling the debate of the uh, of the so-called anti-Federalists. I mean, the, the very terms Federalist and anti-Federalist are, uh, uh, I, I think, go to show what was going on there. I mean, the, the true Federalists, you could say, were the anti-Federalists. Can you can you unpack that a bit for us? Well, the 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 federal the, the Hamiltonians and the Madisonians, and I will combine them here because I think for the, you know given the Federalist Papers, I think we can combine them. Uh, they were proponents of what came out of Philadelphia. Uh, they they uh, call themselves Federalists. Federalism was a popular idea. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, and I think helps shed light on this. One thing that Madison did not get that he wanted was a federal congressional veto over state laws. So when we're looking at the differences between Hamilton and Madison, let's be careful not to overstate them. Sure, they had differences on what the executive uh, should be. Hamilton uh, yeah, seemed to have uh, t- his taste in monarchy, but, but as, uh, as, my, as my article points out, as, as time, uh, part, of the, part of Madison's uh, and he says this privately to people. Part of Madison's motive is to bring some monarchical elements back into the system because they they felt they had thrown the baby out with the bathwater. So is that the what we all? Monarch in theory was supposed to be this this impartial arbiter of, of interests. And even though it didn't work out that way in practice with the British king, he still hoped to have that element there. So that's that's part of his motive. So he's not as different from Hamilton as as, as you you may think. He's different, but you know, let's not exaggerate it. 
Is that what we uh, ended up getting though a bit with – it did, didn't work out to have Congress have a veto but judicial review functions in a similar way? Well, I don't, you know, I don't know how much he foresaw that. That didn't happen immediately, uh, judicial review. There was debate over that. The, the, there was concern in the states on the part of the, the small D Democrats – that the that the judici- that the courts were beginning to be be those the mediator that originally the state legislatures were and people didn't like that because judges weren't elected state legislators were so the 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 the, the radical democrats didn't like that the uh, ma- that the uh, judiciary was emerging uh, as the, as that hamilton i suppose uh, or i mean uh, madison uh, uh, I suppose would have preferred that, but uh, I don't know how soon that takes effect once the Constitution well, we do uh, get has, the, has been ratified. We do get the supremacy clause, but the, which is which is a little bit of a concession that Madison gives that says that the Constitution and the laws and treaties of the uh, past thereunder shall be the supreme law of the land. But that only was in, when they had concurrent jurisdiction over matters with with uh, which is you know, this big sort of preemption question in modern American law. But yes, it is true that Madison wanted to be able to veto state laws because, as you kind of pointed out previously, he he thought that states were prone to craziness. What, he, what the way he would describe it is something like a, a fervor of of interests and faction taking over states uh, in order to take, say, debt relief, uh, point coin, print paper yeah. money to take, you know, to alleviate debts and all these things. But isn't that that's something that libertarians should be against? Is I mean, like, if the Within the state of, say, Massachusetts or when we had Shays Rebellion but also all throughout New England, we did have a constant debtor-creditor struggle and it was whoever was kind of controlling the legislature at different times is going to basically uh, suck the other side dry in different ways. That's something we should be against too, correct? No, that, that's a good point. By the way, on Shays Rebellion, just as an aside, I think that was a ta- more of a tax strike than a – and a strike yes, against, yeah, uh, but they were definitely against. debtors, <laughs> right? I mean, they were losing their farms because they weren't they couldn't pay the taxes. <laughs> but uh, uh, so, but leaving that aside, uh, no, you make a very good point, and I and I uh, I say I say something. I only had a chance to say it in a sentence or two in the in this piece, the Constitution revisited. Um, I, I agree with you. I am not approving of the idea that the that the state legislature sh- should be a, an auction house where you where you're able to go and get what you can't get in the marketplace, like relief from from debt and, and things of that sort. But I'm equally opposed to what Madison and Hamilton uh, wanted in place of that, which was their allegedly, and I stress this word allegedly, uh, impartial ruling elite. I mean, Madison, uh, Hamilton makes the argument that even where he was a working lawyer, so he was not, you know, well born and he was not a gentleman, meaning he just could live a life of leisure. Yeah, he was illegitimate. Toil. He was an illegitimate he was, kid. Yeah, he was. He was a lawyer, so he had to make a living. And when he was arguing that we need people who who are not uh, stuck in the uh, you know in the uh, the mud of the marketplace every day, and therefore having their interests uh, skewed to their own particular uh, you know uh, circumstances, people would say, "Wait a second, you're a lawyer, you make your living at law." He says, "Oh no, that's different. The learned professions are not self interested. We we're like the gentlemen. We can hover above the fray and be impartial." Uh, now. You know the the, the anti federal scoffed at this. They 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 were early public choice types, and and they said no no way is the ruling elite impartial. That's a joke. And they argued that against the, when the Bank of uh, of the United States was being uh, uh, debated, and uh, you know Robert Morris was was talking about how uh, uh, you know the wise men uh, were impartial. They got uh, the, the anti federals laughed at them, or the Jeffersonian types uh, laughed at them. So I'm saying it's a false alternative. This uh, hyper democracy, where you can lose, use the legislature, for, you know, to get you get what you can't get honestly in the marketplace. That's we don't like that, but we also don't like what the alternative being proposed by Madison and Hamilton, which was this this elite, this patrician elite that is, uh, you know, thought to be impartial. Well, I'm trying. Yeah, the patrician elite thing is I mean, that definitely occurred those debates, and that was a big part of just theories of what representatives and people in the government are supposed to be. Uh, with the amount of leisure that was needed to study, you know, mm-hmm. Greek systems and Plato's Republic and things like this, but they did have a large debate, where eventually they came down whether or not to pay the members of the government, and they came down on the idea that they would pay the members of the government, so it was not only the case that people with enough money in reserve would serve in the government. So, like, they they did try to actually counter that a little bit. 
And, and the other uh, debate was whether or not the states or the federal government would pay them and it ended up being the federal government because they didn't want them to be too dependent upon the states. Uh, but that, but th therefore, individual normal people to some extent could serve in the government without having a reserve of cash. Right. And, you know, and the, the, look, the Jeffersonians were, didn't, didn't mind that regular people were getting into the government. They just wanted them to be more civic minded than they, than they were. Uh, so, so you have a you have you do have a divide over whether the common people should the common people should uh, be be in the government be elected to the legislature. And be, you have a division between uh, the Madison Hamiltonians and the Madisonians and Hamiltonians on the one side and Jefferson on the other. But but um, they still thought uh, the people were not sufficiently civic minded or they weren't classical Republicans. One thing that Wood points out is that in, in the dying days, every founding father was upset with the country. They all thought that uh, the revolution was, uh, had been squandered, that, that it wasn't what they wanted because people were too concerned with their own commercial affairs and they weren't, in their view, uh, civic minded. They weren't living the lives of, uh, of classical Republicans. Isn't that what every generation thinks, thinks yes. <laughs> I mean you, you could find similar stuff like that from the Romans talking about the kids these days and I mean they're not, they're not, they're not that, wrestling like, in the nude yeah. anymore and all this so is that specifically a critique of anything going on then or just I mean that's what that's what older people always think well but I think uh, in a way they were right I don't think uh, I think they misjudged human nature I mean people are and I don't say this as a criticism people are interested in the you know raising their families and improving their material condition. And, you know, what is this idea of the general welfare? Uh, if, if we're not going to talk about it in terms of some, and I use the word sum here, S-U-M, metaphorically, the sum of the individual individual welfares. Uh, the, the classical Republicans uh, of, the, of the early of early America seem to think it was something separate. And uh, so, you know, from their point of view, maybe their complaint was valid. It wasn't just, you know, the old, you know, geezers saying what they always say. Is it, is it, Really, a, a big criticism, though, if they if they did, and I, I agree that they did have an idea of the civically minded person who was qualified to hold office in different ways. But but if we're going to have a government, uh, do we want to have people like that in government more than people with? Very localized interests who aren't civically minded. I mean, we could talk about whether we're going to have government at all. But if we're going to have a government, would we want better people of some sort in that government than otherwise? Well, I think this gets to whether you can actually have a government worth having, because you know, what, who are these people? Who gets to define what the better type is? Uh, I, I don't. You know, what are you, what are some people supposed to? What, what were the the civic minded people supposed to do that the other people weren't doing when they got into office. Uh, you know, what is this, what is this uh, unique insight that the certain people are going to have in, in, in terms of ascertaining the public interest, number one. So it's epistemological, an epistemological issue. And number two, what incentive do they have to achieve it? Even if you assume the first part that they know what it is. I mean, this is a public choice issue, right? Uh, that uh, somehow there are people and we just got to find the right people who have this unique insight into what the public interest is. And number two, they'll be uniquely dedicated, single-mindedly dedicated to achieving it. They'll have no interests of their own. They'll never use power for their own glorification or profit or you know any other objective that they might uh, use it for. Well, could we, nature. could we make an, an argument, say that, OK, so the these elites aren't necessarily going to be less self-interested – than anyone else, um, that attorneys are just as interested in advancing the interests of attorneys as bricklayers are of advancing the interests of bricklayers, but that at least these people are <clears throat> more educated, um, have more historical knowledge, say, or in a modern context, you could look at it in like Brian Kaplan's work on the myth of the rational voter, you know, that if if you have you might get better policies if everyone has a deep understanding of economics, at least, because the, you know, that their motives may still be the same, but they're going to at least have a better sense of like how policies might play out in the real world. So it might not be perfect, but it would be marginally better to have people with this body of governing and civic knowledge governing than populism. But I feel like we're venturing into the nirvana fallacy here. 
He goes, the question is, how do you do that? Maybe that sounds really good. Uh, do we, does that mean only PhDs in economics ought to be in Congress? But we know that's no guarantee. Gosh, Paul Krugman has a PhD in economics. <laughs> uh, so how do you actually put flesh on those bones? I don't, I don't see it. I mean, you can talk in really abstract terms about, yeah, if only people under, who understood economics were voting on these bills, we'd be better off. I, okay, I can agree with that. Who really understood economics? Well, does that mean Austrian? Does that mean you know, the Friedmanite? I mean, how do you do that? I wanted to go back to the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists because you talk about yes. this in your piece a little bit. So the Anti-Federalists, which I completely agree, uh, had very – many of them – there's a lot of Anti-Federalist papers, but many of them had very poignant things to say about the Constitution uh, that ended up being correct. Uh, what were some of those things that the Anti-Federalists said about the Constitution? Yeah, and this is good because it takes us into the Bill of Rights, which I hope we, we will we'll get some – Time to talk about a little bit because uh, one of their big complaints was there was no Bill of Rights. Now this is very interesting. Uh, the Bill of a bill, a bill of Rights was not discussed at the Constitutional Convention, the Federal Convention, until the closing days when George Mason, who would go on to become an anti-federalist, uh, raised the issue, and every state voted down, I guess, a resolution to uh, consider a Bill of Rights. Uh, every state unanimously, their their delegations vote in the convention now voted down. Uh, a, a proposal that they had a Bill of Rights. So, but people were surprised that there was no Bill of Rights, according to Wood. And the people at the convention were surprised that the people outside the convention were surprised. <laughs> they were surprised that they're being surprised. They didn't seem to think uh, that was a, a big issue. Uh, it reminds me, as I say in the piece, a little bit of uh, Alexander Hamilton's uh, explanation for why God is never mentioned in the Constitution. Somebody asked him, and there's no reference to God, and he said, we forgot. Uh, now, with the Bill of Rights, apparently they didn't forget. They just, they just said, no, we don't need it. Uh, now, there were Bills of Rights in some of the state constitutions, so it wasn't some kind of new you know, revolutionary idea. They, they were certainly aware of that. But their view was... Well, the Constitution is a Bill of Rights in itself. Number one, it's a Bill of Rights against state, the state power, the, the state legislature's power. That's how Madison saw it. And Hamilton argued, well, why do you need a Bill of Rights if the government, if the federal government, national government can only do what it's explicitly, uh, expressly uh, uh, authorized to do and can do nothing else? then that's a Bill of Rights, right? How can it regulate the press if there's no power for it to regulate the press? Now, I believe this was sophistry. I don't think Hamilton actually believed it, and it's certainly not true. There are unenumerated powers in the Constitution, and I don't care how many times Madison and his followers today say he set up a government of few and defined powers. That is nonsense, and I'll give you one knockdown proof, as I say in the piece. Eminent domain. There's no express power of eminent domain in the Constitution. How do we know the government had it? Because when they added the Fifth Amendment, there's, a, there's the takings clause, which puts some limits on eminent domain, right? It says it's got to be for public use and there's got to be just compensation. We know how, how well that's held up. Go ask Mrs. Aquilo. But that part, point aside, obviously, there was the take away the Fifth Amendment, there's still the power of eminent domain. It didn't grant the power of eminent domain. It simply put some limits on an unstated, presumed power. And if it had that power, it could certainly have other powers that are unenumerated. So th this is nonsense that this was a power. This was a, a, a document of um, express enumerated powers. And in fact, when we get to the Bill of Rights, well, I, I guess I'm jumping ahead here. Uh, so lack of Bill of Rights was one thing. The, the anti-federalists, that wasn't even their most significant uh, uh, complaint. They picked up on it because uh, people in the ratifying conventions said, hey, why isn't there a Bill of Rights? And they recommended the, the conventions actually recommended a, a total of 200 uh, amendments. Some of them were uh, Bill of Rights, kind of the kind of material you'd put into a Bill of Rights. But the NFLers had other, and I think far deeper, more serious uh, uh, complaints about the very structure of the government being set up. They thought the taxing power was wide open and comprehensive. And by the way, the Supreme Court later on agreed that it's an all-embracing power. 
uh, all-encompassing power. They, uh, they, they, they uh, in, in the later income tax cases, they say the government has the perfect power basically to tax anything. There was an exception on it. I think they could, can't tax exports and, or states can't tax exports. There's a, there are exports. There are a couple of uh, uh, exceptions. Uh, they complained about the supremacy clause. They complained about the uh, general welfare clause. They complained about the uh, necessary and proper clause. They had many, many complaints. And they got, in a way, they got bought off. They put all their eggs, unfortunately, not all their eggs, but when it came to arguing with the public, they, they, they put an awful lot of weight on the Bill of Rights. So eventually they said, okay, we'll add a Bill of Rights to shut you people up. That's, that's what Madison had in mind and, uh, and what the other uh, Federalists had in mind when they agreed to go along with adding a Bill of Rights. And the Bill of Rights did not uh, um, address any of the deeper concerns of, of, of the uh, anti-Federalists. And, and this goes to my mystification about uh, you know, how I'm uh, being mystified by libertarians. Libertarians who are committed to the Constitution have to act like the, the anti-Federalists didn't even exist. They, never, they hardly ever talk about them. They were the most libertarian people of the day. Some of them certainly were. Uh, uh, close to being li people we call libertarians. And yet, if, if you're committed to the Constitution, you have to pretend they don't even exist. And that, I can't, uh, I can't well, understand that. It's true to some extent, but the Anti-Federalists had a massive influence on the nature and course of government over the next 30 years from 1789 going forward. I mean, the, the Anti-Federalists had a bigger they punched above their weight going forward and I agree with you. They deserve yeah, a lot did. more respect. Uh, I'm going to push back a little on your eminent domain point though because yeah. – so there are implied powers and uh, there are – you could call them unenumerated powers uh, of the federal government because the eminent domain clause says nor shall private property be taken for public use without the payment of just compensation. So it implies that you can do that. But one way of looking at that is to look at that as a corollary of something like the post roads clause in Article One, Section Three, which gives the federal government the power to make post roads, and also to do things necessary and proper to making post roads, which could include eminent domain. So, not it's actually not implied totally that some of the powers of the enumeration of the powers in the, in the Constitution might include eminent domain as a thing. So when there is eminent domain as an implied power, as a corollary to an enumerated power, then when they do it, they have to pay just compensation. So I'm not sure it's mm -hmm. much of a, of a knockdown point as you, as you make it, but you are correct that there are implied powers in the Constitution and that the anti-federalists were very, very uh, correct to say that the necessary and proper clause would be abused to say the least. Yeah, like I said, they were early public choice uh, um, uh, uh, thinkers and uh, and I think they, they made a big mistake strategically in putting uh, too much weight on the Bill of Rights because once the Bill of Rights came out, then they looked at it and said, this is like whipped cream. It's air and some sugar to, uh, to distract us, but it doesn't address our concerns. But by that point, it looked, so it looked like they couldn't take yes for an answer, right? They said, Bill, we want a Bill of Rights. We want a Bill of Rights. Okay, here's a Bill of Rights. Oh, wait a second. That's no good. Here, we want these other things. They, they just blew the, the strategy. But, but as far as implied powers, I mean uh, – Another telling uh, episode is is when they're uh, uh, debating what would become the Tenth Amendment. Okay, and, and constitutions love to put a lot of weight on the Tenth Amendment. Well, the some, Amendment, some of them, we, uh, some of them do. <laughs> I don't. Okay, so, it says, <laughs> it, 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 so basically, it says power is not delegated to the uh, to the, the national government. Uh, you know, or, or reserved to the people under the states. But there was a representative from South Carolina, Thomas Tudor Tucker, who's, who made an amendment to the amendment. He said, I want, the, I want to insert the word expressly. Power is not expressly delegated. Who stood up to speak against it? Madison. He knocks it down in the committee. He knocks it down in the, in the committee as a whole in the Congress. And he argues there have to be powers by implication. And that's, his, that's his term. There have to, any constitution must have powers by implication. Now, here's the irony of that. You may say, well, of course it does. He said, otherwise, you'd have this infinite list. And he's, he's right about that. But I always learned that Madison was the man who argued against implied powers. When I listened to libertarian-type constitutionalists, they love to talk about uh, there, there are no implied powers. And they, they'll cite Madison saying the powers are few and defined. But here's – Madison is the father of the implied uh, powers doctrine and yet why don't libertarians know that? I think that Madison's view of implied powers is a little bit different. If you read some of his writings where you basically – it can't be a great and independent power. It has to be incidental to the carrying out of something else. And the words necessary proper come from 
old agency law. So if I went to you and I said, hey, Sheldon, you, I'm going to let you run my store for a while. You can do all things necessary and proper to running my store. Uh, that implies certain things that I don't have to state that you're allowed to do pursuant to running my store. And it, but they can't be bigger than running my store. That's like the, the it can't be a, a great and independent power. So this is one reason why I say like saying that you can set up a single payer healthcare system pursuant to the Commerce Clause is ridiculous because you wouldn't embed a single payer healthcare system in the Commerce Clause. It's not incidental to running commerce. But on the other side, you can look at a case like United States versus Ferger from 1919. Wherein they ruled that this is a really clever case, actually, and I think Madison would agree with this. But this is an implied power. So a, a man was counterfeiting bills of lading to extract uh, f loans from banks to say, he, "I have shipments of goods." But he counterfeited those bills of lading, and then he got and, he, and then he was defrauding people. And then they brought the federal government brought charges against him and he said – under the Commerce Clause, he said, no, you can't get me under the Commerce Clause because there was no commerce involved. I made up the commerce. <laughs> the Commerce Clause cannot reach made-up commerce. And the court said, ha, clever. I mean it was, it, it was, it was too clever by half. But it, they went to the Supreme Court and they said, this is clever but clearly Article 1, Section 3, Clause 18, the Necessary and Proper Clause, Oh, this is the kind of implied power you get. So they basically say you're right. This is not under the Commerce Clause, but it is under the power to necessary and do things necessary and proper to regulating interstate commerce. And I think that's what Madison would have thought the Commerce Clause meant. So he is the father of implied powers, but not to the extent that we can set up, you know, no child left behind and all these. Things. He probably should have been wiser to realize that that would have happened inevitably. Is, well, is, what, yeah. What I was going to say was uh, in, in response to that is is that that Madison then at best. Is is uh, revealed as highly naive, which is not his reputation, and the and the anti federalists on the other hand are revealed as highly sophisticated. I mean, anticipating prophetic Buchanan, Buchanan and Tulloch, yeah, prophetic. I mean, they said you're going to hand these kinds of powers to the people that are going to gravitate toward go toward government. I mean, that's effectively what they were saying, and. Madison was able to get away with saying, oh, no, in the great republic, you know, ambition counters ambition and it's all going to be fine. Never thinking that maybe ambitions will get together and conspire together, right, that, 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 that they'll cartelize. Um, so, again, why does he have this reputation among libertarians? I can understand conservatives liking him, but why do libertarians think that he's some sort of demigod? Well, should we – I mean – should we at least say – I mean I guess – yeah, we shouldn't think he's a demigod, but – at the very least, the on the size and scope of govern of the federal government, aside from the slavery issue, which I mean is a very big aside, but in terms of how big the federal government itself was, it did a pretty good job for about a hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty years, uh, which is hard to say has ever happened much in human history of like a government on a federal level that was as as small and relatively contained. As the federal government was under the Constitution before the the progressives and the New Dealers got their hands on it. Yeah, you know, as Hummel likes to put it, the the Federalists got their Constitution, but the anti Federalists got the interpretation yeah. for a while. Uh, and I and I guess we can attribute that maybe to the just the general tenor of the population. The people were distrustful. I mean, they went with the Constitution. Uh, don't forget, a lot of it had to do with the fact that that Washington was the uh, president of the convention and then he was going to be the first president. Everybody knew he was going to be the first president. They tailored Article 1 to the uh, – Article 2 to the uh, – uh, you know, to the expectation that, that Washington was going to be president. I think they let a lot go. That, I mean this is a naivete also because he's not going to live forever even if he even if he can hold the office forever, which he couldn't. Well, he might have I guess until he died. He didn't. But uh, there was naivete there thinking – uh, OK, we'll let it slide because it's going to be Washington. Uh, I, think, I think there was some of that. But I think pe you know, people were distrustful and uh, the Federalists w did not get their, their way on a, on a lot of things. Now, but, but that wore down. Eventually it wears down. Right? A new generation comes along and, and they see government differently because they're, they're further from the revolutionary generation. I think that's all to be expected. Didn't uh, – uh, doesn't Jefferson famously say that the natural order of things is for government to gain and liberty to uh, to yield, to gain ground and liberty to yield? And uh, uh, they set up a system that made it easy. I think it also set up a uh, the Constitution set up a system that made uh, empire 
inevitable. They couldn't have built an a, a international empire under the Articles of Confederation. And I think, and they had empire on their minds. Now, maybe it's not exactly the empire we have today, but I, you know, an earlier article called uh, Empire on Their Minds, and they had a very expansive view of what the government's role should be in trade. For them, free trade meant the government goes out and opens markets with with gunboats if necessary. I mean, we have we get the War of 1812 under Madison, who s- said all these great things about how bad war is, and then the war happens. He, he then goes to war. Uh, so I, I think they had a much more expansive view of government than libertarians uh, seem to. Uh, most libertarians seem to understand, uh, and uh, this is why I'm I'm trying to bring attention to this. How much of this decline of liberty or growth of the state over time is the fault of the specific drafting of this constitution and the rules that they set up, and how much of it is just inevitable with any text? Because I mean, so the Constitution is just words on paper. It doesn't. I mean, it doesn't mean much on its own. It certainly doesn't have any powers on its own. Um, it's always just a piece of text that men and women are going to read and pay attention to, or not pay attention to, or interpret in different ways. And I mean, if there's one thing I learned as an English major taking lit theory courses, it's that the meaning of a text is rather malleable. It's hard to nail down. You know. The text doesn't doesn't assert its own meaning easily. Um, so is there? I mean, could they have done? So you talked about. I mean, they had empire in mind, but outside of that, like, could they have reasonably done a better job? Is it possible to construct a constitution that is actually going to keep government in check, knowing that government is made up of people who have their own interests and their own desires for power? Or is that, to some extent, just a a fool's game? Uh, yeah, the great great point. Uh, I think uh, I think it's largely a fool's game. I think we can distinguish. We could say better and better and worse. Look at the Articles of Confederation. Uh, no power to uh, direct taxation. Uh, I mean, it was really truly indirect taxation, right? They had to go to the states and say, uh, "Give us money." Uh, it would be hard to do what they wanted to do without the power of taxation or the power to. Uh, uh, to regulate trade, uh, you know, Madison, uh, t- according to his biographer uh, Ralph Ketchum, uh, twelve days into the period of the Articles, when Madison is a member of the Continental Congress, he's looking to f- to expand the powers uh, of the government, uh, and there wasn't much to work with with the with uh, with the uh, Articles, and he didn't he never made any headway because he, there just wasn't a lot to work with. Now maybe they would have figured with time, maybe they would have figured it out. Uh, things to uh, you know, things to do, but um, you're right. No constitution, no law can interpret itself. I mean, I, I think it's constitutionalists uh, and libertarians. Uh, I think to some, the ones that uh, are still stuck on the constitution, I think fall uh, prey to this. They act like you could sort of program a, a computer with with the with the interpretation, whether they're originalists of whatever strand or or whatever their philosophy is. Somehow you could put that into a computer. And then any time a dispute comes up, you feed it in, and it's going to give you the infallible, proper interpretation. Well, we know there's no such thing. First of all, who programs the computer? What's that person's interpretation? I mean, how do we, do we vote? I mean, how do we know? You know, that's, that's ridiculous. So I'm a Wittgensteinian on this, right? Rules don't interpret themselves. I mean, and, any, and even in a, uh, if you offer an interpretation, that's subject to interpretation. Now, we have to not forget public choice. I think any good libertarian has got to be a good public choice uh, uh, theorist. Uh, Who's going to be gravitating toward government power? It's going to tend to be people who are going to want to give uh, interpretations that broaden the powers. Uh, That's just the way to bet. And so I think uh, in the end, it is is a fool's game. And um, uh, we shouldn't be surprised by what happens. And and, uh, we shouldn't be surprised that even if we amended the Constitution, uh, today and, and put in only uh, what we think are libertarian sounding clauses that, you know, 50 years from now, liber- the libertarians then will, I think, be making the same kinds of complaints. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more about libertarianism and the ideas that influence it, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.